Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I want to warn you that nothing can be dangerous. <laughs> so that's kind of an ambiguous statement, right? And I intended that as such. So sometimes the things that hurt us are the things that don't really have to hurt us. What do I mean by that? Well, there's some, there's some really big troublesome symptoms that many of us experience. You know, I, I have these myself a lot. Uh, you can have like numbness or tingling in your hands and feet. You can feel brain fog, uh, pressure in your ears, you know, poor short-term memory, fatigue symptoms. You can have your, your heart race, sleep disturbances. You can feel ravenous when you wouldn't expect to. You can lose your appetite. You can have your, your, your mood just really fluctuate. Um, gas bloating, stomach discomforts, random wandering pains throughout the body, very powerful symptoms. So here's the thing. There was a couple clinical trials I want to talk about in which these were noted. So one was a clinical trial in which they were giving a new treatment for irritable bowel syndrome, and they were testing a new medication. Well, the tough thing was that part one group in its clinical trial, they had really bad side effects. 60% um, of the people had noticeable side effects, especially ones in that list that I rambled off. One more big one would be certain types of headaches. So many people had headaches, they had worse nausea, they had various pain show up, they had racing heart, very common. And as many as 10% of people, they were so severe, they had to drop out of the study. And here's the thing, here's what a clinical trial is all about. It's pretty much college-age boys getting some cash. <laughs> That's honestly what the vast majority of clinical trials are. They recruit in college towns, they, they mostly get males, not exclusively, but they'll have someone sign up and they'll say, hey, let's just see what happens and we'll see how this plays out. We'll watch how your symptoms might change from this. So in this one, about a tenth of them had to quit because they had such bad side effects. Now, there was another similar study on treatment for fibromyalgia. So different demographics, different population, really similar outcomes. We saw big side effects that showed up. Uh, about half had some side effects in that list that I mentioned. About 9% had some of them so bad, they quit the trial. So quitting the trial means you don't get paid. <laughs> and people are doing the trial because they want some extra cash. So it's gotta be significant. You've got to have clear, strong symptoms to drop out of a clinical study. You know, you, put, you went through a lot to get into it. You had to be qualified and go jump through a lot of hoops. You won't quit for light reasons. So a tenth of people in these studies had bad enough side effects to quit. Now, you may have heard about placebo groups. So many studies will do a placebo group, meaning half of the people take a pill that really can't do anything. And there's been a huge amount of medical research into what really is a placebo. And most use pretty harmless rice flour. So no gluten, no corn, no allergens, no chemicals, no medications, no salt, no vitamins, no minerals, pretty much rice flour. And it's universally agreed, and I wouldn't argue, that that won't be harmful, that that won't really endanger anyone. And yet, in those studies, when people receive placebos, many get big therapeutic benefits. You know, it's also safe to assume that no one's going to have a radical transformation of their health by taking a little capsule of rice flour. So when that does happen, we call that a placebo response. But the placebo response has an evil twin called the nocebo response. And that was what happened in those studies on irritable bowel syndrome and fibromyalgia, people on placebo pills had bad side effects. They had nocebo reactions. So they were doing a study, and in their minds they thought, you know, I'm taking some weird thing, maybe I'll get sick from it. But here's, here's part of it. They were also told you might take a placebo. You might take a pill that has zero active ingredients, and that's a possibility. But they were concerned about having possible side effects, and they had side effects. And they were real side effects. So we've seen things like, for example, in these cases, people can have measurable changes in their breathing. And they can have real lung constriction. They can have real changes to their heart rate. They can have real changes to their digestive function. They're not making it up. They're very real symptoms. And even further, they've done some nocebo studies in which they've given medications that block the nocebo response. So let me, let me walk you through this. This is a little wild. So one group of people is given a blank pill and they're watched to see if they have side effects. 
one other group of people is given a blank pill and a real medicine, actually a mild narcotic, that blocks the part of the brain that has placebo or nocebo responses. The most common one used is naltrexone. So half the people get a blank pill, and you know about a tenth of them get side effects from it. The half of them on the blank pill, but also getting a blocker that they're not aware of, they don't get the side effects. So it's totally clear that the side effects in those cases were because of their expectations, and they're very real. So if someone has those symptoms, they can't be ignored or poo-pooed or discounted or said that they're all in their mind. Why do I bring this up? Well, in, in my story, uh, I went through a lot of modifications to my diet. And as an adolescent, that was positively life-changing. You know, I dropped weight, I got healthier, but it went further than it should have. And there was a period of time in which, you know, by this point I was an older teenager and I was in college. And, you know, it can be a t difficult time in life. You're sorting out what you're going to do and your career path and, you know, sorting out a lot of big things. And I had a lot of typical angst and frustration. And those types of things create symptoms of anxiety, of poor digestion, of numbness and tingling, of headaches, and you name it. Because I was so steeped in education about foods and good foods and bad foods, I was misattributing a lot of the symptoms to the foods I was eating. And I found more and more experts that validated that and said, oh yeah, that food will make you sick. That is bad for you. You must restrict that. And I got narrowed down to this box of pretty much raw food veganism at one point. And further, I got narrowed down to a box of like one meal a day of raw food veganism. Now, if you're running five to ten miles a day, if you're walking two miles to and from school, and you live in northern Minnesota where it's 40 below, <laughs> that's not a sustainable diet. And the paradox is, if you do restrict too much, or you do get yourself more fearful, you will feel worse. You will have more symptoms. And the danger is, you can get more mentally convinced of your efforts because you're seeing more symptoms. It's so true that obviously these things are affecting you because you're affected. And I went down a bad spiral until finally I got my way out of that bit by bit, very slowly and very non-directly. But I've seen so many people with foods and also with, with very safe supplements to where, uh, here's a classic scenario, someone's got a high cortisol level. And I saw a woman a while ago to where very, very high cortisol. We checked and made sure that she did not have medical reasons for it, thankfully. She did not have Cushing's disease, Cushing's syndrome, but she had extremely high cortisol. And that creates fear and anxiety. One of the ways you can lower cortisol, along with all the great ways of treating the causes, is a plant called lemon balm. Uh, the genus of that is Melissa, Melissa officinalis. It's crazy harmless stuff. You know, it's used in teas. You can buy it in grocery stores. It's under a GRAS, or generally recognized as safe list. So plants, you can think of them on a continuum. There's some that are very powerfully medicinal, and they've got, they can cause side effects, and they can be very carefully dosed, maybe by even drop dosages, but they can do harm if they're not used right. And there are other plants which are pretty much carrots, you know, <laughs> you can, you're not going to die from eating a carrot. There's really no danger for many things that we use as common foods. And many, many plants, many adaptogens, they're quite a ways over on that food side of the continuum. Those are the ones that I like because they're safe. So a very small dose of lemon balm caused severe side effects for her. And we talked about the whole nocebo effect, and she was receptive to it. She understood that it was more, more a fear about a response than it was the actual chemistry of the plant, and she was able to move past that over time. But I've seen many so badly limit their health, and I think that the culture we have of health education is so wonderful, and it's so great to be able to talk to you and share things with you. The pitfall is that if you learn a lot, you can get yourself scared. <laughs> And you can hear any number of very well-educated, very well-meaning experts, many of whom are friends of mine, that will tell you about legitimate concerns. And the tough part is, they can spiral too far. And we can reach a state at where the fear that we have is causing us more harm than the things that we're ingesting. You know, our food, our supplements, our diets. And I've seen many people where that's really spiraled like it did for me. So I just want you to think about that, that nocebos are very real, they're very powerful, 
And it has nothing to do with whether you're gullible, it has nothing to do with your level of education, but they can cause real effects. And medications that change parts of the brain can stop them from working. So it's proof that they, they are strong things and they're very tangible. When you approach your, your health habits, a good thing is to always be suspicious of those types of symptoms first off, those that are coming and going, so the, the variable mood changes, the, the episodic palpitations, the occasional numbness or tingling, sometimes the really intense sensations of head fog or ear pressure, the, the random headaches. So now when a symptom does really persist, if you can see some clear triggers, like every morning if you miss breakfast you get a headache, that's pretty solid, you're probably getting low blood sugar. But the things that come and go randomly, those you really should put some suspicion on that they can be very powerful, and they may come on right after you did XYZ, but XYZ may not have caused them. They may have sort of been more of a correlation than a cause. So this is especially true if it's hard to pin down the cause and the cause seems to change. If it seems that one day eating a cucumber you know, caused a stomach ache and another day a different food did, it may not have been the food. That may be more of a nocebo response. And the symptoms are real, the effects are totally tangible, but limiting or changing the foods is not the solution for it. So look deeply at ways to raise, first and foremost, raise your security. You know, get, get enough sleep, get healthy outlets, get some good exercise, but really have a healthy skepticism of your own mind and your own symptoms. And that seems odd, but we really do need that. It's great, I find it a great exercise to journal and, you know, talk about feelings and talk about symptoms, and you can see more clear patterns that way. The things that come and go that don't have clear causes, they may not be necessary, and they may be more nocebo effects. They may go on their own. And sometimes by just seeing that, by like breaking through some level of illusion, they can improve for you. So I'm wishing you great health, vibrancy, and good clarity on what matters. We'll talk again real soon.